Daniel Sherman will be presenting a paper entitled Garde que les coupures, clipping in the archaeological archive. Daniel is the Lineberger Distinguished Professor of Art History and History at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His books include Worthy Monuments, Art Museums, and the Politics of Culture in 19th Century France from 1989, The Construction of Memory in Interwar France from 1999, which won several prizes such as the J. Russell Major Prize and the Lawrence Wiley Prize, and French Primitivism and the Ends of Empire from 2011, which also won several prizes such as the David H. Pinckney Prize. And I believe this year he has an NEH fellowship. Right. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Maddie. People are sometimes surprised to learn that I was a student of John Merriman's. It's certainly true that my own research interests have taken me uh, in the, initially with his blessing uh, in quite different directions from his. But John and I have always met both literally and methodologically in the archive. When I was his student, John was still engaged in his informal but deadly serious competition with Richard Cobb to complete the Tour des Archives Départementales. <laughs> but John's victory was certain thanks to his willingness to work in places uh, where Cobb refused to set foot, uh, notably La Roche sur Yon, or at least so the story went. Knowing that I could never compete in this league, my Archive Departemental total stands at around 10, although it does include Pepeti, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I began at first unconsciously to seek out eccentric archives, a way of impressing the father figure while retaining some autonomy. <laughs> My current project on archaeology and the media in early 20th century France and Tunisia has given me occasion to reflect on some unusual archives and archival practices, newspaper clippings. A handwritten note on the external folder containing the fairly thin file on the Glazelle affair in the Archive Nationale de France contains on separate lines this bureaucratic phrase, Monsieur de Bar, Glazelle, Dossier à classer, garder que les, coupures, que les coupures. Didn't seem that important to me at the time, so of course I don't have a picture of it, but it's in my notes. Glozelle is a hamlet, or lieu dit, in the southern Allier, uh, approximately three hours and 40 minutes by car from Baluzuk, I just checked, and not far from Romanesque Church, so um, Chris and Laura have probably been there. Um, uh, where farmers plowing their land discovered what seemed to be a Neolithic trove in, 19, in 1924. Dubar was the head of the Direction de l'Enseignement Supérieur at the Ministry of Education, in charge of the government support for research programs, the ancestor of the CNRS. The note instructed him, or more likely a subordinate, to file away, classé, the report, indicating that the affair no longer required the attention of the state. Although it is undated, this notation probably was made after the Ministry's Commission des Monuments Préhistoriques decided not to list, another sense of classé, Glozelle as a prehistoric site in January 1928. In so doing, it effectively sided with the many scholars who had cast doubt on the authenticity of the Glozelle finds, culminating in the negative report of an international commission of archaeologists that visited the site in late 1927. At this point, the state officially had no further interest in Glozelle, a private excavation taking place on private land. The departmental archives of the Allier in Moulin similarly contain only a slim official dossier on Glozelle. But what about that notation, keep only the clippings? Why clippings? Why only clippings? The chief characteristic of the Glozelle archive is its selectivity. When I referred to slim official dossiers, it was to distinguish between those generated by agents of the state and those that come from private collections. Both the national and departmental archives actually have quite substantial holdings on Glozelle, as does the Regional Archaeology Service, the SRA, in Clermont-Ferrand, another archive where I'm fairly sure John hasn't worked. Uh, but they acquired these documents not through the normal regulated process of versement, but by gift. 
The holdings in Moulin include the archives of the Société d'émulation du Bourbonnais, the SEB, and yes, I, I think they would accept your membership. Uh, the local learned society that was called on to provide advice on the initial find, but became a center of skepticism about Glozel. After a Vichy doctor named Morlet took over the excavations in 1925 and began to publish the results. The SRA papers in Clermont-Ferrand came from Auguste Odolon, an epigraphist and dean of the faculty at the University of Clermont-Ferrand, who vocally endorsed the authenticity of Glozel and whose son was a lawyer on the Glozelian side. The Odolon papers in Clermont-Ferrand deal exclusively with Glozel. They were given to the SRA by descendants clearly impressed and perhaps also puzzled by the sheer quantity of material their kinsmen had assembled. Both the Odolon and the Société d'émulation papers contain a large proportion of clippings. In addition, the papers of Salomon Reinach, the academician who became the leading defender of Glozel, housed at the Bibliothèque Méjean in Aix-en-Provence, and those of several of his colleagues at the Bibliothèque de l'Institut de France, contain a great deal of correspondence about Glozel. These manuscript collections are haunted by the ghosts of the discarded clippings to which many letters refer. I attribute their absence to manuscript librarians' zealous commitment to the hand and accompanying disdain for printed ephemera. In October 1927, René Dussault took out a subscription to the Argus de la Presse, a commercial clipping service. Dussault was a busy man curator of ancient Near Eastern art at the Louvre and a professor at the Ecole du Louvre, editor of the leading journal in his field, and like Reinach, a member of the prestigious Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, or AIBL, the central clearinghouse for archaeology in France, then and now. Like many clients of the Argus, he was using it to keep track of his own achievements and timed his, subscriptions to his subscription to coincide with the publication of a long essay in pamphlet form denouncing Glozel as a forgery. But the scope of the selection went well beyond his own publication to include any article with the keyword Glozel. Within three weeks, Dussault wrote his fellow academician Camille Julien, he had received 728 clippings. By the time he let his subscription lapse, lapse at the end of February 1928, the pile of clippings numbered nearly 1,500 individual items from newspapers all over France, Europe, and the Empire in nine languages besides French. And you get to consult them in the delightful uh, reading room of the uh, archives of the Institut de France. Among the clippers, only Dussault's motives can be identified with any clarity. His letter to Julien suggests that he was tracking the public response to Glozel as an ongoing battle between two sides, and he expressed satisfaction when the tide seemed to be turning against the authenticity of Glozel. Other shared clippings is a form of information exchange. Reinach's correspondence in the provinces, for example, made sure he saw what they considered significant articles or letters from the regional press, while he occasionally shared with them clippings from low circulation establishment newspapers, notably the Journal des Débats, that might be difficult for them to access. Like attachments or hyperlinks, the clipping's existence as an enclosure could serve several purposes beyond the merely informative. Emile Esperandieu, one of only two other members of the AIBL to share Reinach's belief in the authenticity of Glozel, wrote him from Nîmes with a clipping from a Toulouse paper he thought would boost Reinach's morale. Quel bon apotre, he wrote of its author. This is the clipping as exclamation point. In contrast, Denis Perroni, director of what is now the National Museum of Prehistory in Les Aisies, in the Dordogne, and a member of the International Commission, wrote Reynac to complain about defamatory comments made by Morlaix. His brief letter begins by asking sar sarcastically, do you not read the Dépêche de Vichy or La Rumeur? One must have very little to support one's argument to get to that point. If Perroni here seems to be disparaging the provincial press and by extension the Clipper's obsession with it, he also enclosed a clipping from the Courrier du Centre designed to demonstrate Morlaix's lack of credibility. This is the clipping as exhortation, paralleling Perroni's pleas to Reinach to attend to other voices. And of course my archival notes say not there because the clipping has been discarded. 
The Société d'Emulation and Odolon Clippings files, though nowhere near as comprehensive as the Dussault Clippings, extend further in time in both directions, and they both include a number of complete issues of newspapers and loose clippings, as well as the Argus-like clippings pasted to pieces of paper. Together, they convey something of the complexity of clipping as cultural practice. Not simply a form of information storage or exchange, clipping can also can be regarded as an effort to preserve something of the materiality and randomness of the past. The randomness that, as Benedict Anderson has observed, results from the very layout of newspaper pages, although the newspaper imposes some rudimentary order upon it. Clipping, of course, disrupts the newspaper's order, but it nearly always gives rise to another one. An article from a 1918 issue of the Revue des Bibliothèques, a library science journal, describes how the library of the Army's Service de Santé at the Val de Grasse came to house an extensive collection of clippings on the public response to the service's work. Pertinent articles were clipped daily and pasted onto sheets that were gathered in quarto albums. Although the albums contained monthly summaries, the difficulty of indexing them alphabetically resulted in an organization by subject, exceptional at the time in French libraries. On this librarian's view then, a clipping becomes useful when it moves from the factitious unity of its originary publication, based chiefly on simultaneity, to a substantive unity organized around categories of knowledge. This kind of clippings file represents the cutting edge of library science in the 1920s. In an article on the University of Michigan Library in the Revue des Bibliothèques, Ivan Odon, about to become librarian of Paris's Musée d'Ethnographie, wrote admiringly of the chemise à anglais and tiroir classeur that housed the much used clippings collection organized alphabetically by subject. Without such an organization, however, librarians on both sides of the Atlantic warned in the 1920s and 30s, clippings files would quickly outgrow their usefulness, threatening to overwhelm users with a mass of undigested knowledge. Nor did librarians minimize the challenges categorization posed. Readers of a 1926 issue of Special Libraries would find immediately after the article Standard Classification for News Clippings, which was a plea rather than a prescription, a, uh, another ominously entitled Difficulties in the Way of Standard Classification. Yet this precarious balance between the useful and the overwhelming arguably informs the amassing of clippings by private individuals and can still be detected in the fairly summary efforts libraries and archives have made to sort through uh, and categorize them. In general, an approximate chronological arrangement competes with one that preserves some traces of provenance. One box of the SEB files, for example, is labeled with the name of the member who, as who assembled it. And if the keyword Glozel was sufficient for a commercial service like the Argus, the sheer bulk produced under that rubric cries out for subcategories while making clear the difficulties they presented. Would we file Glozel under archeology, span prehistory, or perhaps forgery, rural art, France, 20th century. To return to that precarious balance, clippings by their nature trouble the still useful distinctions Susan Stewart has made between the souvenir and the collection. Stewart describes the souvenir as always, quote, metonymic to the scene of its original appropriation, unquote and as a sample of now distant experience. The collection, in contrast, replaces the origin with classification. The clipping as material object, of course, originates in clipping as an act of mutilation. And yet the clipper almost always understands that act as simultaneously an act of collecting. Very rarely does anyone intend to clip one and only one article. If moreover for Stewart, the scrapbook album belongs to the realm of the souvenir, the three albums in which Odolon or some assistant pasted Glozel clippings for the better part of four years testify to the ordering instincts of the collector. The presence in the Odolon and SEB uh, collections of a number of complete issues of newspapers, uh, on the other hand, suggests a certain resistance to the subordination of the constitutive objects in collections to an overall narrative. 
It is as though in these instances, Clippers wanted to want to be reminded and to remind posterity of what else might have been on their mind when a significant offense in the, event in the Glozell saga took place. In an article about Clipping's files first published in 1930, a government librarian named Armand Boutillier du Retail uh, described the rêve of the Institut International de Bibliographie in Brussels, quote, de constituer sur l'ensemble des connaissances humaines un fichier total. But Carolyn Steedman has described the archive following Bachelard as, quote, a place of dreams a place to do with longing and appropriation, with wanting things that are put together, collected, collated, <coughs> named in lists and indices, a place where a whole world, a social order may be imagined. In part because it involved a controversy over knowledge that pitted local savants against Paris-based scholars with international reputations, Glozel clearly struck many individuals as a worthy object of their own archival collecting. Some may have relished Clipping's inverse relationship to archaeology, taking a whole and turning it into fragments, while working within a fundamentally archaeological epistemology, one that posits a missing whole from the sum of its available parts. Yet the obsessive clipping of the inter interwar period, I think, goes deeper than this. Every passion borders on the chaotic, Walter Benjamin, Benjamin writes, but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. Clipping embraces this passion and under the cover of attempting to bring order to it, vaunts the pleasures of being at the edge of the abyss. And, and I, I would just want to conclude by thanking John for introducing me to those pleasures.